If we go back in history to the arrival of the very first dinosaurs, we should find ourselves in the Triassic period, around 250 million years ago. It was at this time, after an unprecedented biological crisis, that the dinosaurs arrived on Earth. Our planet has experienced several mass extinctions, including the one that put an end to the existence of non-avian dinosaurs some 165 million years later. The latter is undoubtedly the most popular with the general public. But what is less well known is that it was neither the only nor the most important one. The extinction that marks the end of the Permian and the beginning of the Triassic, which we're about to look at, was like no other. It was the most devastating extinction of all. This mass extinction occurred around 252 million years ago. As we've seen, it marks the boundary between the Permian and Triassic geological periods, and thus between the Paleozoic and Mesozoic eras. And the era of the dinosaurs is the Mesozoic era. This era is itself made up of the Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous, respectively. Right now, we're between the Permian and Triassic eras, in the midst of the chaos that reigns in every corner of the globe. In the collective imagination, an extinction is violent, sudden, and very rapid. It would arrive like a gigantic bomb, capable of wiping out three quarters of the Earth in a fraction of a second. Contrary to popular belief, this extinction is spread over several thousand years and has many causes. Since 2021, we know a little more about the origins of the Permian-Triassic extinction. For a long time, it was thought that only the volcanoes of the Siberian traps were responsible for the chaos to come. But we now know that it's probably a little more complex than that. While Siberian volcanic activity is a perfect match in terms of dates for these climate changes, a study published by Nature Geoscience sheds light on another very intense violent terrestrial activity that extends over a long period of time. This is Australian volcanic activity. It predates the Siberian traps and lasted for almost 4 million years. Based on the latest results of this study, published in May 2022, this activity could explain a change in climate prior to the extinction event, starting several thousand years ago, particularly in the ocean. This earlier, longer-lasting change is far more likely than a rapid, violent event. Climate change is a gradual process but it impacts all elements of the biotope and biocenosis. The consequences are irreparable. The Siberian traps are mainly characterized by huge outpourings of basaltic lava. Australia is a different kettle of fish. Eruption activity is high, but also very violent. Australian super eruptions are said to have been marked by catastrophic explosions, spewing huge quantities of ash and gas into the atmosphere. These ash deposits can now be seen in numerous sedimentary series throughout eastern Australia. Researchers believe that these could be the most violent eruptions the Earth has ever seen. It is highly likely that these explosive eruptions were accompanied by the massive release of greenhouse gases, initiating the climatic upheaval that led to the biological crisis that marked the end of the Permian. However, volcanic activity in the traps cannot be ruled out. Let's just say that while the Siberian traps may not be the sole cause, they could well be the last straw. According to a study dated 2021 for PNAS and conducted 
by several Norwegian, American, Chinese, and Dutch scientists, the massive and rapid emission of predominantly volcanic CO2 is responsible for the Permian-Triassic biological crisis. The volcanic phenomenon led to an estimated temperature rise of between 5 and 8 degrees Celsius, or between 9 and 15 degrees Fahrenheit. A difference of this magnitude is bound to have a colossal impact on the biotope and biocenosis. All ecosystems are at risk. Global warming and ocean acidification have made the planet unlivable, explain the scientists. During this ecological catastrophe, the oceans were the first to be affected, becoming dead zones. The decomposition of aquatic plants and animals in turn created clouds of poisonous gas. The air became unbreathable and asphyxiating. During the Permian-Triassic period, almost all biodiversity disappeared in less than 100,000 years. 96% of marine species and over 75% of terrestrial species were devastated. But nature always rises from the ashes. After this unprecedented crisis, life managed to breathe new life into itself. Some species have survived, others are about to blossom. If nature manages to reclaim its rights, it is not without difficulty. It took several million years for flora and fauna to regain possession of numerous territories. Some species managed to escape the worst. These include synapsids such as the cynodonts, ancestors of modern mammals, and the crown group of archosaurs which dominated the entire secondary era giving rise to dinosaurs, flying reptiles, and crocodiles. Dinosaurs have one thing in common. Their skulls feature an opening in front of the eye socket, known as the anti-orbital window. But we'll have time to talk more about them soon. Right now it's time to meet some of their descendants. Dinosaurs are extraordinary animals. They lived on Earth for millions of years and have a lot to teach us. Thanks to technology and a healthy dose of scientific knowledge and study, we can initiate a virtual journey to the Mesozoic era. Take a seat and settle in. The adventure begins in the Triassic, and your journey starts now. Here we are in dinosaur land. This is Pangaea. A vast ocean called Panthalassa surrounds this landmass, forming a single continent. Contrary to popular belief, Pangaea does not have a single climate. The land of the dinosaurs was neither a vast swamp, as far as the eye could see, nor an almost tropical jungle. The climate was not the same on either side of the continent. In the center of Pangaea, comprising present-day Europe, the Americas and Africa, the climate was predominantly desert. On the other hand, what is now India, Siberia, and even Antarctica enjoy a temperate climate. The Earth is a far cry from what we know today. It's as if someone has mixed up all the pieces of the puzzle nothing seems to fit. And yet, for tens of millions of years, this was the configuration of the Earth. This unique land was also the cradle of the dinosaurs. These animals experienced a variety of climates, geological periods, and adapted to different environments, from deserts to mountains to jungles. Around 230 million years ago, the first members of the dinosaur group began to appear. Depending on geographic zone, environment, and climate, animals diversified to adapt. If you remember from our little introduction, we mentioned almost 1,200 species, 
and that's just the species known to man. So you can imagine the diversity that reigned in this large family. When we think of dinosaurs, we immediately think of large animals, but the earliest dinosaur specimens are a far cry from the usual cliché of giant dinosaurs. The oldest confirmed dinosaurs, which lived 230 million years ago, were Saurischians. First of all, there's Saturnalia, a dinosaur whose classification was long debated until 2007 as it includes features of both sauropodomorphs and theropods. It measures around 1 to 2 meters, or 3 to 6 feet in length, and is probably no taller than an adult's knees. At the same time, there was also the Staurichosaurus, this ancestor of both sauropods and theropods was discovered in South America. It's hard to describe it with any precision because we're up against our scientific limitations here. We lack real, identifiable, and analyzable elements. With the few remains that researchers have at their disposal, they have been able to make estimates. Judging by the size of the jaw, it seems to be one of the smaller dinosaurs measuring 2 meters or 6 feet long. It probably weighs just 30 kilograms, or 66 pounds. Its sharp teeth suggest a carnivorous diet. That's about all we know about it. Then there's Herrerasaurus. He too is a bipedal carnivore. It measures between 3 and 5 meters, or between 10 and 16 feet long, just one meter or three feet high, and weighs up to 350 kilograms or 770 pounds. It's a pretty fearsome carnivore. It has a jaw with a flexible articulation and sharp curved teeth. This mouthful of teeth enables it to rip the flesh off all the vertebrates in its ecosystem, including herbivores of the Rhynchosaur order, such as Hyperadapodon, Huxleyi, and the Dechinodont order, as well as omnivores of the Edosaur order, such as Etasauroids, Scaglii. Another dinosaur in the featherweight category is the Eurapdor. It, too, is very small compared to the Diplodocus or Brachiosaurus that illustrate children's tales about dinosaurs. It measures just 1 meter, or 3 feet long, and 40 centimeters, or 16 inches high. He was probably more of an omnivore. He had five fingers on each hand. The three longest ended in large claws, which he used to hold his prey he would quickly pounce on them to take them by surprise and stack the odds in his favor. But thanks to its large claws, it could also catch plants. It is assumed that it fed on small animals, tender leaves, and fruit. Paleontologists who have studied the remains of Eurapdor believe it to be one of the oldest known dinosaurs. Why do they think so? Because it is not a highly evolved predator. All the evidence suggests that it is a primitive dinosaur, so to speak. Unlike theropods, it doesn't have a slippery lower jaw to hold its prey. Likewise, only a few of its teeth are curved and crenulated. In a more evolved predator, all the teeth have acquired this shape. Yet we know that Eurapdor belonged to the Saurischians thanks to the configuration of its thighs and pelvis. Eurapdor is therefore older than Herrerasaurus. Finally, there's Alwalcaria, considered a basal saurischian, a small bipedal omnivore that shares many similarities with Eurapdor. These are the first small dinosaurs you might have encountered in the Triassic period. 
but other dinosaurs, even in the Jurassic era, were small. Compsognathus is no longer than one meter or three feet and weighs around 2.5 kilograms or five pounds. Despite this, it has made its mark on the land of giants, just like the Anchiornis. It measures no more than 30 centimeters or 12 inches high. Its bird-like appearance has complicated its classification by scientists. But Michael Pittman, a paleontologist from the University of Hong Kong, and some of his colleagues seriously believe that it was either a primitive bird or a bird-like crodontid dinosaur. In other words, it is a primitive member of the dinosaur group, which includes birds and bird-like dinosaurs. They share their closest common ancestor with birds. In the Cretaceous II, we can still encounter small dinosaurs. In 2022, scientists discovered one of them. The paleontologists published their discovery in the journal Scientific Reports, describing a dinosaur between 94 and 97 million years old. It measures around 1.5 meters or 5 feet in length, including tail and weighs between 4 and 7 kilograms, or between 9 and 15 pounds, about the size of a domestic cat. The animal is robust, yet knows how to protect itself. Fossils have revealed the presence of a series of bony plates between the neck and tail. This is Jacopil, Cania cura. Not all dinosaurs were giants. We could mention many other dinosaurs of modest size, but I'd like to tell you about the origins of these animals, about their ancestors, who are just as modest in size as those we've just mentioned. The first dinosaurs appeared at the end of the Triassic period. Their anatomy has a number of features in common, which is why they form a group and are thought to share a common ancestor. They have reduced fourth and fifth fingers, four legs, a tail, thick skin, and a pelvis united by three or more sacral vertebrae. They also have oviparous reproduction and legs located under the body rather than on its sides. This is what unites dinosaurs within the same family and allows us to attribute common origins and a common ancestor to them. So who was the ancestor of the dinosaurs? This common ancestor is to be found among small, lightly built archosaurs that show the beginning of dinosaur locomotor adaptions, such as Marasuchus, discovered in the Middle Triassic of Argentina, or Congonaphon kelly. It's the latter, measuring just 10 centimeters or 4 inches, that we're mainly interested in. Can you imagine? 10 centimeters or 4 inches only, and yet he's the father of such colossi as Diplodocus, Argentinosaurus, Brachiosaurus, T-Rex, Stegosaurus and Triceratops, whose dimensions are far more generous than his. Congonaphon is small, very small if you compare its measurements with those of the most popular dinosaurs, but it is one of the last common ancestors of dinosaurs and pterosaurs. It is therefore at the very origin of the evolution towards dinosaurs. Dinosaurs and pterosaurs belong to the Ornithodire clade, their last common ancestor before their separation some 230 to 240 million years ago. Congonaphon kelly is close to the divergence between dinosaurs and pterosaurs. It could therefore be one of the missing links in biological evolution. But how did this little creature manage to survive and get through the climatic crises?
As we saw above, the Permian-Triassic crisis led to a drop in biodiversity. As this drop in biodiversity impacted plant life, oxygen production fell. The depletion of oxygen in the atmosphere would have favored species with air sacs, such as the ancestors of the dinosaurs. The latter also had down covering their skin, as is the case with Congonaphon. This would have helped its thermoregulation. As the second half of the Triassic period was characterized by extreme climatic changes, with very hot days followed by very cold nights, the small feathers would have enabled the creature to maintain a comfortable internal temperature. Speaking of origins and evolution, you may have noticed that dinosaur species are very diverse. It's a very heterogeneous group and yet we classify them all in the same group. It's hard to find a glaring similarity between the Anchiornis and the Ankylosaurus, isn't it? And yet they do belong to the same group, and we're going to find out why. To better appreciate and understand dinosaurs, it's important to be able to tell them apart and classify them. There are two main groups of dinosaurs. We sometimes confuse these groups with their diet, whether carnivorous or herbivorous, or their posture, whether on two or four legs. The difference between these two groups lies in their pelvis. The orientation of the pubis, a bone in the pelvis of tetrapods, points downwards and forwards in saurischians and rather backwards in Ornithischians. Determining and understanding what distinguishes these two groups will enable us to learn more about dinosaurs. Saurischians differentiated themselves around 230 million years ago. They are themselves divided into two groups. First, there are the theropods, Theropod means animal feet. Theropod fossils have been discovered on every continent, in rocks dating from the Upper Triassic to the Upper Cretaceous, i.e. from around 225 to 65 million years ago. Theropods are bipedal, generally carnivorous. Their hind limbs provide support and locomotion. The front limbs are short, but equipped with movable fingers. These fingers are undoubtedly adapted for grasping and tearing prey. There are several major groups of theropods. The oldest is the Ceratosaurus. They range in size from the tiny Colophysis, less than two meters or seven feet long, to the Ceratosaurus, around six meters or 20 feet. Then there are the Tetanurians. These are the successors to the ceratosaurs we've just seen. The Tetanurians include carnosaurs such as Allosaurus and Cholerosaurus, a larger group that includes Tyrannosaurs, Dromaeosaurs, and Ostrich dinosaurs. In both cholerosaurs and carnosaurs, many bones were hollow, and the jaws generally bore sharp curved teeth along their entire length. Herosaurus, one of the oldest known dinosaurs, was undoubtedly a theropod, or one of their close cousins. Colophysis was probably one of the first theropods. This group also includes Tyrannosaurus, Velociraptor, and Baryonyx. These bipeds vary in size. They can weigh anything from a few kilos to nearly six tons. Sauropodomorphs are quadrupeds, generally herbivores. They have small heads resting on long necks. 
They also have long tails. Their group name means lizard-footed form. In the late Triassic, there were two main groups of sauropodomorphs. The prosauropods, which means before lizard feet, and therefore before sauropods, were medium-sized, like Lufengosaurus. Then there were the sauropods, meaning lizard feet, which could reach gigantic sizes, like Apatosaurus. Diplodocus and Argentinosaurus belong to this group. They had imposing bodies and large stomachs, enabling them to digest large quantities of foliage. Most also had thumbs, terminating in large claws. Platyosaurus is a fine example of a sauropodomorph. It measures between 8 and 9 meters, or 30 feet, in length. It probably moves most of the time on its four legs, but it can stand up on its two hind legs. Prosauropods and sauropods spread throughout the world. While prosauropods disappeared in the lower Jurassic, sauropods continue to diversify throughout the Mesozoic. The other major group is the Ornithischians. A large part of the pubis is directed downwards and backwards as in birds, and not downwards and forwards as in most reptiles. When it comes to birds then, we'd be inclined to think that their ancestors were Ornithischians. But, paradoxical as it may seem, birds are descended from Saurischian dinosaurs. But back to the group of dinosaurs with bird-like pelvises. The Ornithischians can be divided into two subgroups, the Seropods and the Theriophores. Theriophorus means shield-bearer. They have a cuirass on their backs with bony plates, but sometimes also spikes or spurs. Herbivores, theriophores, are armored dinosaurs and, for the most part, quadrupedal. They comprise two main groups, stegosaurids and ankylosaurs. These two groups share not only dermal armor, but also a variety of other features, including their small teeth, arranged in a single curved row. Both groups derive from a line of smaller armored dinosaurs, such as Scutellosaurus and Scalidosaurus from the Lower Jurassic. The seropods include the ornithopods, pachycephalosaurs, and ceratopsians. The latter two groups often group together under the name marginocephalans. Ornithopods are known from the beginning of the Jurassic to the end of the Cretaceous. They are therefore among the dinosaur lineages that had the greatest and longest evolutionary success. This group includes the Fabrosaurids, Heterodontosaurids, Hypsilophodontids, Iguanodontids, and Hadrosaurids. Fabrosaurs are the oldest and most primitive ornithopods. These small, lightly built dinosaurs grew to between 60 and 120 centimeters or between 24 inches and 47 inches in length. Hadrosaurs, on the other hand, could reach 9 to 11 meters, or 30 to 36 feet in length. They are duck-billed dinosaurs. Their posterior teeth, crushing and located inside cheeks, were very well adapted to chewing vegetation. They traveled in herds, and cared for their young, who were very immature at birth, as is the case with most mammals and birds today. 
hadrosaurs include Shantungosaurus, Parasaurophilus, and Lambiosaurus. Hypsilophodontidae are great runners. They measure between 1.5 and 4 meters, or between 5 and 13 feet in length. This group includes Hypsilophodon. Among the Iguanidae, of course, we find one of the most popular dinosaurs, the Iguanodon. Equipped with complex teeth, typical of advanced ornithopods, it is the largest of its kind, reaching 11 meters or 36 feet in length. So here is what we can learn from the great dinosaur family and the Cerisian and Ornithischian groups. Despite their great divergences, dinosaurs have a lot in common and a common origin. Biological evolution has enlarged the family with groups and subgroups. But there's one thing we forgot to mention. We didn't mention marine dinosaurs or flying dinosaurs. In your opinion, are they classified as Cerisians or Ornithischians? Well, we can't classify them in the dinosaur family for the simple reason that they're not dinosaurs. These marine reptiles from the dinosaur era are sometimes called marine dinosaurs, seemingly logical. But dinosaurs are only terrestrial. No dinosaurs lived exclusively in water. Marine reptiles mistaken for dinosaurs do not have the same characteristics, origins, or common ancestor as dinosaurs. They therefore do not belong to the same group as dinosaurs. Ichthyosaurus, Plesiosaurus, and Mosasaurus are marine reptiles. Why differentiate between these two families, dinosaurs and marine reptiles? Why isn't the animal we see here moving in the ocean a dinosaur? Yet it lived in the Mesozoic era at the same time as the dinosaurs. As we have seen, specific animal classification criteria lay the foundations for each family, each class, each group. In that of the dinosaurs, we noted that these animals had four legs and that these were located under the belly. This is not the case with our marine reptiles. As you can see, if they do have four legs, they are only on the sides on the animal's flanks, and not under its belly. Dinosaurs and marine reptiles don't have the same common ancestor either. Marine reptiles cannot therefore be dinosaurs. We're looking at an ichthyosaurus. This sea behemoth can reach up to 20 meters or 66 feet in length. It's a very popular marine reptile that looks a bit like our modern-day dolphins. This carnivorous reptile had an elongated snout and powerful jaws with sharp teeth. It fed on fish, ammonites, cephalopod mollusks with spiral shells, and belemnites, cephalopod mollusks related to cuttlefish. We imagine it to be a fearsome predator. Indeed, it has been for nearly 160 million years, but limiting its lifestyle to this trait is a bit simplistic. Contrary to our image of a solitary, aggressive predator, Ichthyosaurus was also a social animal. A recent study into the behavior of Ichthyosaurs was published in Cell Magazine in November 2022. The results clearly show that Ichthyosaurus had similar habits to our whales. Ichthyosaurs migrated extensively and above all lived in groups during the birthing season.
The team of paleontologists in charge of this study used a micro CT X-ray scanner to study a precise geographical area, a fossil deposit located in the Humboldt Toyab Forest in Nevada, USA. They found embryos and newborns of a species of ichthyosaur called Shaunasaurus. Why were so many ichthyosaurs concentrated in one place? This is the mystery that paleontologists have been trying to unravel. Thanks to the use of technology and various analysis tools, a climatic cause, such as a sudden change in temperature, has been ruled out. Nothing had disrupted their ecosystem. Mass stranding has also been ruled out as scientists are now confident that the bones sank to the bottom of the sea. It's likely that there was no food for them in this region, and yet we can see a large number of newborns and embryos. So what does this tell us? Well, the American National Forest, which could have been described as an ancient burial ground, is in fact an ancient maternity hospital. Ichthyosaurs used to gather here to give birth to their young. They were undoubtedly returning to the place where they themselves years earlier had given birth. But back to the dinosaurs, and to be more precise, the flying dinosaurs we haven't yet classified, Pterosaurs are part of the dinosaur bestiary. They lived during the same period. But pterosaurs are not dinosaurs. Dinosaurs are ornithodirid diapsid archosaurs. This somewhat barbaric term refers to a group of animals. It consists solely of dinosaurs and their descendants and pterosaurs. These are the only two groups in this animal class. Of all the different groups of dinosaurs, the pterosaurs are the closest. It's hardly surprising, then, that we find a family resemblance and tend to confuse them. Pterosaurs were the first vertebrates to tame the sky, at least as far as we know. Like dinosaurs, pterosaurs come in a wide variety of species, some, like the Sordae, measure barely 60 centimeters or 24 inches, while others, like the Anhangera, approach 4 meters or 13 feet. The Pteranodon has a wingspan of over 6 meters or 20 feet long. But that's nothing compared to the gigantic Hatsigapteryx which, with its wings spread, could practically cover a bus with its 10-meter, or 33-feet, wingspan. If they are so close to the dinosaurs, it's because they share a common ancestor. At some point in their history, evolution allowed dinosaurs on one side and pterosaurs on the other to hatch. What happened between this common ancestor and the pterosaurs? What are the stages of evolution? What are the different links in the chain that led to the birth of flying vertebrates and thus to the hatching of pterosaurs? Well, the mystery remains and the question still unanswered. For the moment, no tangible evidence has been found to fully and scientifically resolve this enigma. Millions of years have passed between the common ancestors and pterosaurs. The physical difference between the two is more than striking, since one is winged and the other probably a small four-legged terrestrial vertebrate. Even so, all the most primitive pterosaurs we know today are well-developed, and several species already existed at this time evolution was well underway. The stage preceding this phase of evolution is not yet known, 
For the ancestor of pterosaurs to give rise to true pterosaurs, one species had to have evolved differently from the others. A species that would be closer to pterosaurs in terms of physical appearance or flight capabilities, but which would also have something in common with an exclusively terrestrial species. This key species is a fact we are certain of, but we currently have no fossils that would enable us to piece together the puzzle to establish a sufficiently solid link to find this famous missing link. Nevertheless, one hypothesis seems more serious than the others and could provide a semblance of an explanation for the missing link. If a species of terrestrial vertebrate jumped from tree to tree or even hovered for a few seconds during its jump, like some flying squirrels for example, then this species would be the keystone species. Some scientists believe that this famous species had a little skin between its legs and probably lived in tropical forests. This evolution would have enabled it to protect itself from ground-dwelling predators. If this species did indeed live in tropical forests, this would explain why we have found no fossil evidence of its presence on Earth. For fossilization to be possible, several conditions must be met. Immediately after death, the body must be buried under sediment, silt or sand, otherwise the organism will decompose completely. If these initial conditions are met, the skeletal bones will be preserved, the rock will be created, mineralizing the bones which will become a kind of stone and therefore a fossil. However, these conditions are extremely rare in the forest, which offers us very few fossils. When you think about it, it's quite paradoxical that the environment with the fewest fossils is also the one with the richest biodiversity. Indeed, if we look at today's tropical forests, they are home to the greatest variety of species. So we'll have to wait and see if we can find out more about the origins of pterosaurs. If this question remains unanswered, there are many others about dinosaurs that have been answered. It's time for us to find our dinosaurs and discover the many secrets they have to reveal. We've seen the difference between pterosaurs and dinosaurs, the difference between dinosaurs and marine reptiles, and we've even skimmed the classification of the different dinosaur species. But to really understand dinosaurs, we need to investigate further. A dinosaur is also renowned for being a cold-blooded, ferocious reptile and not very intelligent. But let's dive back into the Mesozoic era in the light of the latest knowledge and find out what life was like for the dinosaurs. The question of dinosaur body temperature often comes up. Were they cold-blooded or warm-blooded? One might think that these animals were cold-blooded. They are reptiles, so logically we'd compare them to the snake or lizard we know. But on the evolutionary scale, Dinosaurs fall between birds and reptiles, and birds are warm-blooded. So what's really going on with dinosaurs? Research has been carried out recently and the results are surprising to say the least. Scientists, including paleobiologist Jasmina Wyman from the California Institute of Technology, relied on technology infrared spectroscopy, to be more precise, that targets the interactions between molecules and light. In other words, the method uses infrared to quantify the number of waste molecules in fossils. Why is this rate important, and what secret does it hold for us? An animal's metabolism essentially boils down 
to the efficiency with which it converts oxygen into energy. Warm-blooded or endothermic animals have a high metabolic rate. They need to breathe large quantities of oxygen and eat more to maintain their body temperature. Conversely, ectotherms or cold-blooded animals such as reptiles have a more moderate activity level and depend on external conditions to maintain their body temperature. In short, they don't bask in the sun for pleasure, but out of necessity. They have a low metabolic rate. The metabolic rate, i.e. the greater or lesser capacity to convert oxygen into energy for life, is therefore the most convincing indicator of body temperature. The use of oxygen in an organism leaves traces. Technology allows us to detect these traces on fossils. These traces, in the form of bone remnants, can be detected using infrared light. We can now study metabolism from a new angle and calculate the metabolic rate, even in animals that disappeared millions of years ago. Once this rate has been calculated, we still can't determine the body temperature of the fossilized animal. This data must be compared with other verified and validated data to establish a scale of comparison. Based on this scale of magnitude, established on all the animals we know today, and by comparing these data, we can deduce the animal's body temperature and dinosaurs were warm-blooded. At least most of them were. Of the two major groups of dinosaurs we mentioned earlier, the Ornithischians included some cold-blooded specimens, such as the Triceratops. But its large ruff undoubtedly helped to regulate its temperature. This may also be the case for Stegosaurus, with its spine, which also had a low metabolic rate. They were massive but slow herbivores. By contrast, the other group, the Saurischians, the most numerous in terms of species, and above all offspring, like the T-Rex for example, were essentially warm-blooded. Reconstructing the biology and physiology of extinct animals is one of the most difficult things to do in paleontology. This study adds a fundamental piece of the puzzle to our understanding of evolution. Their body temperature sheds light on their lifestyle and needs. The discovery that most dinosaurs were warm-blooded is a small revolution in the world of paleobiology research. We now know that dinosaurs were warm-blooded animals, but they were also oviparous. In other words, their mode of reproduction was through the egg. The amniotic egg has turned biological evolution on its head. Until the beneficial protection provided by the egg, we had to fight to survive. For the first few billion years, life was only able to establish itself in an aquatic environment. Water provided lift, but on land, surrounded only by air, it wasn't the same. The skeleton had to strengthen, solidify, and consolidate. The skin had to become thicker, and the mode of reproduction had to adapt. While some animals, notably reptiles, acclimatized to life on land, reproduction is more complicated. These animals had to lay their eggs in water. The egg is still fragile. It doesn't take much for life to hatch. Without a shell or protective membrane, out of the water it dries out and shatters the life it harbors. Over time, the amniotic egg makes its appearance and this changes many things. The shell prevents evaporation of the water inside, while allowing gaseous exchanges inside. There's an internal membrane, the amnion, 
in which a liquid, the amniotic fluid, bathes. This liquid is precious. It protects the future little one. We used to think that dinosaurs were cold-blooded because we compared them to reptiles. To find out how long it takes dinosaurs to incubate eggs, we compared them to the birds they are closest to, which also lay eggs. By comparison, scientists estimated incubation times for dinosaurs at between 11 and 85 days. But this average is about to be called into question by a study published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences and carried out in the USA. Darla Zelenitsky, assistant professor of geosciences at the University of Calgary in Florida, and her team of researchers took a close look at the embryos made available to them. They were able to analyze an egg of Protoceratops, a small herbivorous dinosaur of the Ceratopsian family that lived in the Upper Cretaceous. Its size is comparable to that of a sheep. The embryo studied came from an egg weighing around 200 grams. Another embryo analyzed in the same study was that of a huge fossil of Hypocrisaurus, a duck-billed dinosaur whose egg weighed over 4 kilos. It looks like a basketball. This is hardly surprising when you consider that the size of an adult Hypocrisaurus is estimated at between 9 and 10 meters or 33 feet long, and its mass at between 2.5 and 4 tons. What will the researchers analyze in the embryos to learn more about the incubation period? Well, they'll be looking at the teeth as they hold all the answers. Teeth contain a wealth of information. For this study, the scientists are particularly interested in the growth lines of teeth. In fact, they function much like the rings on the stumps of a tree. Analysis of the dentition of these two embryos revealed that the incubation period was much longer than previously thought. This time, dinosaurs are closer to primitive reptiles than to birds. Protoceratops had an incubation period of at least three months while Hypocrisaurus was probably over six months. This long period before the eggs hatched is probably one of the possible answers to why they became extinct. Indeed, during the climatic upheavals and the Cretaceous crisis, such a long incubation period may have been a serious handicap to the survival and perpetuation of the species. However, it's not for lack of trying on the part of the parents to protect their eggs and juveniles. After the egg, it's time to talk about parenthood. Were dinosaurs only ferocious, savage, and bloodthirsty beasts? Here again, studies reveal some surprising facts about these animals from another age. Some fossil remains even suggest quite the opposite. Dinosaurs were capable of fiercely defending their young, designing nests, educating, and passing on knowledge. The Protoceratops we mentioned earlier, a small herbivorous dinosaur with a duck-like beak, defended its eggs and nest with great fervor. It's a small herbivore and not well equipped for attack, but it doesn't give up. Using his beak and massive head, we can imagine him trying to ward off this velociraptor. The two adversaries, one fighting for the survival of his young, the other for his own survival, will both die fighting and end up buried by a sandstorm. At least, that's what the remains of their bones, intertwined with each other, have revealed. This story is far from being an isolated one among dinosaurs. Psittacosaurus fossils may also bear witness to the parental and benevolent spirit of dinosaurs. 
paleontologists have found a single Psittacosaurus surrounded by 34 small dinosaurs clustered in a circle. Very little is known about their deaths. What we do know is that it was quick and took place in the midst of activity. At least that's what the positions in which the dinosaurs were found suggest. But what really interests us here is the large number of hatchlings and the presence of a single adult. This fossil configuration resembles a kind of dinosaur nursery. An adult plays the role of nanny, protecting the group's young. It's still too early to say, but it's possible that other dinosaur parents may have taken advantage of this nanny's help to fetch food for themselves and their young. Oviraptors, on the other hand, settled into their nests in the manner of the birds we know today, their bodies positioned in the center of the nest, and their arms stretched over the eggs to protect them. Fossils here once again confirm the protective nature of another member of the dinosaur family. In the 1970s, a gigantic fossilized nest was discovered that had been home to hundreds of Myasaurus specimens over 80 million years ago. Jack Horner, the paleontologist who discovered them, studied the fossils with great care. Their position their configuration in relation to each other, the estimated age of each one. Everything has been examined with a fine-tooth comb. This time, the clues reveal that dinosaurs were not only able to protect eggs, but also to play a protective role after they hatched. Indeed, they also looked after their young once they were born. But how can we be sure? Well, from the fossils found in and around these nests, we can see that there are several young of different ages in the same nest, and traces of fossilized vegetation. This means that Myasauras not only fed their babies directly in the nest, but also cared for both newborns and juveniles. Myasaurus weren't the only ones to care for their young over a long period of time. Scientists have been able to prove through fossil analysis that Psittacosaurus and Massapondylus, for example, were also very involved parents. Among herbivores, we have been able to study footprints. This evidence is invaluable. They tell us how they moved. Did they move slowly or quickly, in groups or alone? But footprint studies can also tell us how the group itself functioned. Indeed, scientists believe that some herbivorous dinosaurs moved in herds to be alert to attacks. Numerous footprints have been found, enabling us to analyze the herd's workings in detail. It has been observed that young dinosaurs were placed among the adults and that these herds were adept at long seasonal migrations. But there's another area where dinosaurs are just as surprising, that of intelligence. The intelligence of dinosaurs has long been the subject of debate. In the collective imagination, dinosaurs were simple reptiles, a little silly, not very bright, or even a little simple. In other words, they weren't intelligent. Why should we think so? This idea stems from the size of the dinosaur's brain, which was not very large. The most commonly used method of measuring intelligence is to compare brain size to body size, known as the encephalization coefficient. In many dinosaurs, notably the T-Rex, this EQ, or encephalization coefficient, was low. It was therefore thought that dinosaurs were not very intellectually developed, 
or thoughtful beings. Some of them stood out from the crowd, notably Trudon, reputed for many years to be the most intelligent dinosaur known, with an EQ of 6. Raptors rivaled them with an EQ of 5.8. To give you an element of comparison, humans have an EQ of 7.44. That's the highest. With humans at the top of the chain, it was felt that this method of calculation was a good way of assessing intelligence and making it measurable and comparable. Thanks to the fossils found, scientists were able to calculate this encephalic coefficient by comparing the size of the body with the size of the cavity housing the brain. But this method has since been called into question. Chimpanzees are renowned for their intelligence, as are many great apes, which are capable of creating tools for opening fruit or finding insects in stumps or anthills. They are also able to communicate and learn. Numerous experiments have been carried out, revealing the surprising abilities of these animals However, if we look at the EQ, the chimpanzee would be an idiot, as it barely reaches 2.49. The limitations of this method are clearly evident. Raptors and trudons may have been highly intelligent, but that doesn't mean that others weren't. Still less that we should generalize this lack of intelligence about all dinosaurs. Some might even surprise you.